expectation values, for instance, is always going to be of this type of integral equation of the I mean integral equation of the Dyson type, right? Here, suppose that W is the your unknown, and then you would like to find the solution of this integral equation. Then I, I will try also to emphasize that although, as you will immediately realize, ladder diagrams are not the, the total contribution to expectation values or correlator of these Wilson loops, despite of that, their resummation in the strong coupling limit uh, capture essential features of, of, of Wilson loops, at least in this case, of, of course, with the analysis. So, well, let me start with the motivation of this problem. <coughs> well, and first of all, let me motivate the, the, the gauge theory. I have chosen n equal four super young mills. I always say it's the simplest interactive non abelian four dimensional field theory. And moreover, it's the prototypical gauge theory, or it's the gauge theory in the prototypical example of the ADS CFT correspondence. So, if you would like to understand, to learn about interacting four dimensional non abelian gauge theories, and you would like to know about ADS-CFT, I think it is the simplest case. I mean, the, the first thing you would like to understand is n equal 4 super young mills. Well, why to consider Wilson loops in this theory? Well, Wilson loops in any gauge theory are very important observables because you can extract out of them a lot of physical information about, about the gauge theory you, you are considering. You, for instance, you can read from the expectation value some certain Wilson loop, what is the quark anti quark potential, or you can also read what uh, sometimes it is called the Brestalum function, which is just the coefficient that calibrates the energy emitted by an accelerated quark or particle in general. So, yes, that's about Wilson loops in general, but in particular, in the case of N equal 4 super young mills, Wilson loops are a, a nice arena to, to, to employ or to, to test. A lot of theoretical tools that have been developed in, in recent years or in, uh, to, to access, to go beyond the perturbative regime. So you can try to explicitly resummate uh, some, per some perturbative expansion. You can use ADS-CFT correspondence. You can use integrability. You can use conformal bootstrap or even supersymmetric localization. So all these uh, fancy theoretical tools can be applied to the description of, of, of Wilson loops in n equal four super young mills. Today I will focus, if, if you let me, about the first line. I, I mentioned briefly also some connection with supersymmetric localization. <coughs> and, and I will also emphasize what I said at the beginning, that even, that even though ladder diagrams are not all the possible diagrams you can you can you can consider. Uh, they are enough to, to capture in some cases qualitative features, but in some other cases even quantitative uh, features of the strong coupling description of Wilson loops. So let me outline the talk. I will just reviewing for you or introducing for you what what are the kind of Wilson loops you are going to consider in equal four super young mills and how to account them in the dual string theory using ADS-CFT. Then I will uh, show how to consider the, 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 the resummation, how to, to how to see that, that the resummation of ladder diagrams can be translated into a Dyson equation, both for the expectation value and correlators of Wilson loops. Then I, I will try to to take uh, two different, as I said, I mean, in general, this is not the whole st the whole story, but there are a few situations in which you you can you can extract quantitative features of the expectation value of Wilson loops using just uh, only ladders. One of them is uh, some cases, some supersymmetric cases, in which you can show or you can argue that the ladders are the only contributions. All other type of diagrams cancel just by beauty of supersymmetry. So in, that ca in those cases, the ladders is the exact answer to the description of Wilson loops. And then there is, I will also discuss 
another limit, another case in which, in general, ladders is not the exact description, but it is the leading uh, contribution in some parametric limit. Okay? You define some limit in which the ladder diagram's contribution is the, is the dominant contribution. And, and in, in those cases, you can go to the strong Kaplan limit and, and contrast with, with some ADS-CFT or some ADS-CFT prediction, so some computations in string theory, and of course, show the identity. So I eventually will just summarize and, and comment about some prospects for the future. <coughs> well, of course, uh, you have to at any moment you need to stop me for any questions, please. Feel free to do it. Well, Wilson loops are non-local observables in any gauge theory. You find through the holonomy of the gauge potential. So it, they, they, the Wilson loop measures the non-abelian phase, the non-abelian phase that an external non-dynamical particle gets when it is forced to move along some contour. Uh, and, and as you can see here, it depends two arguments. One of them is uh, the trajectory of the particle, so it depends on the trajectory uh, through this pa the parametrization of the curve, but also it depends on the type of particle through the, the, the representation in which you take this trace. So today I'm just going to be focusing on the fundamental representation, so that's why I'm talking about quarks. So, but still, we, we can consider different curves. As I said, one of the reasons to, to focus on to study Wilson loops is because you, you, can, you can get physical insight of the theory by considering some particular types of, of trajectories. Let me discuss two examples, typical examples. So for instance, you can consider this very elongated rectangular loop of, of the preferred two anti-parallel lines. Uh, so the expectation value of such a Wilson loop is going to be the exponential of something which is proportional to this very long extension t times some function of the distance. This function of the distance is nothing but uh, the quark and the quark potential. And the quark and the quark potential is a, is a very crucial quantity in any gauge theory because it can tell you whether the theory is confined, confining or not in this, in this situation. For instance, uh, if you compute the, this quark and the quark potential and you get that this b the dependence with, with the distance of this B function is proportional to the distance. So if, so if you separate the, the, the quarks, they this grows linearly. So this, this the expectation value of this Wilson loop will be the exponential of some constant times R times T. R times T is the, the area of this rectangle. So this is the famous area law. So when, when the, the, the Wilson loop expectation value goes to like the exponential of the area of the loop, your theory is, is confining, right? Of course, this is not the case of n equal force to Niels, which is a conformal theory. So in that case, the quark and the quark potential has to be one over r, but still, there is a constant you, you would like to fit in front of it. Another thing that you can you can extract out of a Wilson loop is the Prestralum function. So uh, how to the relation is, is as follows. So if you consider um, a wavy line. A wavy line is just a, a, a trajectory which is slightly deviating from the, from the straight trajectory. If you compute um, the expectation value on such a wavy line, you can extract a coefficient that is precisely the coefficient that goes in front of this um, Larmor's formula that measures the energy emitted by, a, by an accelerated quark. So this is just the integral of the, the square of the acceleration. So these are two physical quantities that, that you can just compute using Wilson loops and tells you about the information about the theory in general. Of course, I'm not going to be discussing this, this object today. Today I'm going to be discussing cert certain, as I said, circular Wilson loops, which are uh, uh, other kind of loops, in, 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 in which are very special in the case of an equal force of Well, the kind, let me say something else about the Wilson loops I'm going to be considering. Because in n equal force to Young Mills, before I just defined 
the Wilson Lucas, the holonomy of the KC potential, but in n equal force to pre young mills, there are other fields in the, in the action representation. For instance, you have, in addition to the gauge potential, you have fermions, but also you have six real scalars. And it turns out that you can use this scalar to define this other Wilson loop. So if, if, if you prefer, it's like this external particle couples not only to the gauge fields, but also to the scalars of the of an equal force to the young mills. And the reason to, to add in this additional coupling to the, the scalar fields of n equal 4 is that if now if you take, so you have six uh, possible scalars to couple to, so you have here a, a, a vector in R6. It happens if you take this vector to be unitary, to be of my modulus uh, norm 1, uh, this Wilson loop is locally supersymmetric. So there is a, a preserved supersymmetry which depends on the point on the loop, there are even cases in which you can take it to be globally supersymmetric, but in any case, uh, it turns out that eventually is this possibility of having locally supersymmetric is crucial for the simplification of many computations. So this is the kind of, of Wilson loop I'm going to be considering, taking, as I said, always the fundamental and different uh, trajectories if you want. But even if you do that, um, the Wilson loop is going to be a non-trivial function of the coupling of your theory. So wh what can you do? Well, if this coupling constant is uh, small, as, as, as usual, you, you can always do like a, a perturbative expansion, uh, expand this exponential and start to compute uh, expectation values of, and then you would get like a, this is a propagator connecting two points in the loops, and then you can have that with loop corrections or more points. So you have a, a diagrammatic uh, perturbative expansion of expectation value, but of course, as usual, this is only valid as long as lambda is a small number. Otherwise, the things you would be omitting are, are, are uh, much important than the ones you are, you are uh, writing here. So what about the opposite regime when the coupling is very large? Well, as usual, in, in this is one of the things why ADS EFT became so popular is that you can rephrase a complicated problem into a simpler into a simpler one by appealing to the ADS EFT correspondence. So how to describe Wilson loops in, in, in ADS EFT, in the ADS EFT dual picture? Let me just briefly argue how it is the idea. So if, if you remember what how do you get uh, the n equal four super young mill uh, degrees of freedom in, in, in the in the dual ADCFT picture, you start with a stack of many D3 brains. So the n equal four degrees of freedom here are nothing but the, the lightest open strings ending on the stack of these three brains. So you have n of them, so those are the open strings are just uh, in the action of Qn. So, but as I said, the, the Wilson loop is, a, is an external non-dynamical particle in the fundamental representation. How, how to get out of this picture such a, such a external particle? Well, you can do it by separating one of the D3 brains. If you separate one of the D3 brains, an open string that was attached to this D brain now gets a, 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 a very large mass. So essentially this is freezes its dy dynamics, so it becomes non-dynamical. And moreover, from the point of view, the remaining uh, the brains in the stack is seen as just a fundamental a particle in the fundamental representation because it has it ending only one of the ends of the strings ending on, on the stack. And moreover, so this is uh, the, the if you want this is the the full geometry, but ADS EFT also accounts um, or implies going to the near horizon, and when you go to the near horizon, and this geometry looks like ADS phi crosses phi, what you see is an open string that is flying to the boundary of ADS. So essentially, <coughs> this is what motivated uh, all the problems in ADS CFT. The, the, the data of the, 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 the CFT enters as a boundary condition for your computation in, in, in the bulk of ADS. But this picture what was what motivated Malacena already in 98 and also uh, Ray and G in 98 to, to 
how to account Wilson loops in, 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 the, in the string theory. So a Wilson loop in the fundamental representation is just the partition function of an open string with a precise boundary condition such that the endpoints of the string uh, end on the boundary of ADAs on a given contour, the contour that specifies the Wilson loop. So I if you want to compute the expectation value of this Wilson loop in the, in the dual string theory, you have to path integrate over all open strings such that they are open, th their ends uh, go along the contour, in the boundary. Of course, this is in general. This is in general a very difficult problem. This is those are open strings in, in, in a sort of space time in ADS, so it, it would be very difficult to, to say something exactly about this. But what we do in general is okay. Let's start for with the, 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 the simpler uh, situation where we can say something, and it is this is the case of a semi-classical approximation. So if you are in the regime in which the the coefficient in front of the string action is very large. You can saddle point approximate this path integral, and this is just roughly to lead in order um, the exponential of minus the minimum of this action. But the minimum of this, this, this the, the action for the string, what you compute is the area of the worksheet. So it's at the end of the day, you have to find to lead in order when the, the coefficient in front of this action is very large, you have to find what is the minimal area ending on the contour. So it's just finding the minimal area ending on a contour. But to, to justify uh, for this semi-classical approximation to be valid, what you need is, as I said, the coefficient in front of the string action to be very large. What is the coefficient you have in front of the of the string action? Of course, you have a 1 over alpha prime, or if you want this 1 over the, the typical string length square, times you pull out a factor of r square, where r is the radius of this background of anti the sitter where the, the string is propagating. So the effective tension of the string is not 1 over alpha prime, but r squared over alpha prime. And as I said, for this to be valid, this has to be a very large number. When you look at ADS-CFT dictionary, the radius of the ADS-CF, the radius of ADS squared over alpha prime, or the, the length of the string square, is nothing but the square root of lambda. So this semi-classical approximation only val is valid only when the square root is very large. But uh, that's good because this opens the possibility to explore this other regime, which was difficult with perturbative me method, by just the semi-classical approximation of the string theory. So this is nice, but if you're interested in, in precision tests, so make, making explicit comparisons of uh, field theory computation with uh, some ADS-EFT prediction, is in general very challenging because the field theory computations are valid in general perturbatively for a small lambda, while the string theory results for this semi-classical approach at least is valid only in the opposite regime. So if you want, if you are uh, after this kind of precision test, what you need is to get exact results in lambda in this interacting non-abelian for dimensional theory. This is very rare, so this is really difficult in general. But of course, you, ca you can focus on a particular aspect of your theory in which you can you can get exact results. This, this uh, theoretical method that I mentioned at the beginning, of some some possible tools. So in n equal four to the mills, the you can get exact result for Wilson loops, either summing diagrams using integrability or supersymmetric localization. So those are different possibilities to, to get exact results. Once you get an exact result, you can just take the strong coupling limit of your exact result and then compare this exact, the strong coupling limit of this exact result with the ADS-CFT prediction, comparing with a, with a string theory computation. So today I'm gonna just focus on some particular way of getting an exact result, which is by brute force summing some perturbative diagrams. Questions so far? What is what I was just saying? So, other questions so far about the idea of the
well, as I said, there are going to be some supersymmetric Wilson loops in which this is going to be exact. There are other guys in the parametric limit which is the dominant. In some cases, it's, it's exact. Other questions? Okay, so let me <coughs> still, this is still a review because this is going to be. Um, well, let, let me say, say, be more precise what I mean by a ladder diagram. Ladder, I mean, you, you when you expand this expectation value of a Wilson loop, you're going to have all possible kind of diagrams. So a ladder diagram is a Feynman diagram with no vertices. Yes, it's like a Gaussian truncation of your theory. So if you have a Wilson loop, well, you can have this, uh, but then at two loops, you can have this, two propagators, or you can have like uh, this kind of, of loop. Well, this, and you can have also uh, like uh, this kind of things. Uh, this is this is order lambda square. This is order lambda. All these are lambda square. The, the idea is that um, ladder diagrams are going to omit this kind of. So you see, it's not only partial account, uh, partial account of the possible domain, but whatever are the simplest. Because typically these diagrams are simpler to to consider than these other kinds. So, but as I said, I, I will justify why it is uh, reasonable to omit these guys in some cases or in some limits. So this is what the ladder diagram is. A ladder is a Feynman diagram, which is only uh, taking into account propagators, no vertices. Vertices are all set to zero. No, 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 I'm just saying, for the moment, I'm just saying, let me focus on the, uh, this particular family of diagrams that do not take this into account. Then I will argue why it is reasonable. For the moment, it's just a working assumption, right? Is it clear? So for the moment, uh, there is no reason to leave. I, I, I will eventually also <laughs> restrict the planar lab diagrams as well. Yeah, yeah, you, you, I mean, you, you, this is, by definition, this is also a ladder diagram, but uh, the, the kind of flies and equations are not going to take into account this. But Any other question? Good. Okay. So what 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 I want to do is just let me define this non-abelian phase factor. This is more or less uh, like an open version of the Wilson loop operator we have. So it's still the, the path order exponential of a contour integral. But now this is the trajectory. This is open in the sense that it is not trace. So it's a and also, it is an open trajectory, so it's, it's a curve going from T1 to, to a point x T1 to another point x T2. So, and this, what I'm calling with O here, is just what we had in the um, in the definition of the Wilson loops we were going to study in equal force superior metrics. We call that before I was writing a, a general coupling of a unit vector with the six scalars. Now I'm saying that this is just one zero 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 or, or sorry zero 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 one such that this is only by six. So I just saying that this additional coupling with the scalar is such that it's constant along the loop and it's only pointing in, in, in the always in the same direction. So but then as you see this if you now take the trace of this non-abelian size factor and you choose and you compute the expectation value, and then you go to values T1 and T2 such that they, they, they correspond to the same point, that could be the expectation value of the Wilson loop, right? But in general, it's something more general. If you then evaluate it in, in, in such special points, you, you, you can get the expectation value of the Wilson loop. Okay. And as I said, I will compute this if you want. I not compute this expectation value in general, I'm going to just com compute or take into account the ladder contribution. So to, con to take into account the ladder contribution, I'm only going to consider uh, the free propagators of the theory. So, And here in this operator O, I have 
gluons and, and this scalar field. So the propagators are similar. So they go like lambda over n, one over the separation square, and then you have deltas. These deltas are the, the color indices, and then you have a delta AB, which is in the in the R symmetry index of the scalar fields, and you have something similar for the for the gluons. Here you have delta mu nu. It's delta no eta because I'm in, in a gluon space. Good. And now, so suppose that this is a generic curve going between a point in P1 to another point in P2. So you would like to, to, to compute the correlator of two of these o operators that were in the, in the argument of this exponential. But each, each of these has a gluon and a scalar field. So there, by this uh, dashed blue line, I'm combining the propagator of the of two scalar fields, and this is the first term in this affected propagator, and also the propagator between the two gluons, and this is the second term here. So at the end of the day, so this correlator between an O insertion in T with another O insertion in T prime, you get like an an affected propagator between that depends on T and T prime, and this is going to be a, could be a complicated function or, or a simpler one. It depends on how do you take this curve because you see here it's just the right hand side. On it depends only on the parametrization of the curve. So, well, let's say that you now thi these pictures, I'm despite I'm drawing uh, straight lines, they, they represent generic curves so far. So it's just a schematic. But let me represent. this this w function schematically by a, by a blue blob right yeah, so if you think perturbatively you can have well it may, might be that there is no propagator no effective propagator connecting any points of, of the no points of, of on this segment between 0 and t or you could have one propagator or you could have two propagators and so on and so forth so if you have nothing this is just the one if you have one propagator is going to be one of these G functions, T prime. You, if you have two propagators, you, you need to identify four points. It could be that the first one connects with the second, the first one connects with the fourth, or the first one connects with the third. But now I, I, I following solid suggestion, I want to just keep planar diagrams because I'm going to be studying this Wilson loop in the large end limit. In the large end limit, so the reason is different diagrams with different numbers of closed contours here are going to have different powers of n. So this is going to be suppressed by a power of 1 over n squared. So if, land, if n is large, this is a good approximation to this with this non-planar diagram. You see it's non-planar because one of the propagators rows over the other. Okay. But can, how can we get an integral equation for this for this guy. So the, the idea was as follows. So now you, you, you we are tracing this uh, this W we were having here. So this blue blob there is there are two possibilities. Either you, you, you have no propagator or you have at least one. If you have no propagator it is just uh, the trace of this, which is n, but if you recall there was a 1 over n in the normalization, this is just 1. If there is at least one propagator, yes, you can identify the propagator that connects the rightmost point in this segment. So, and I called T prime the rightmost point in this segment 0t that is connected with the propagator. So to the right of T prime can be no propagator by my definition of the rightmost. And I call T second the point which is connected with the rightmost point connected with the propagator. So I'm going to have a factor of an effective potential G of T prime T second because of this. But then, okay, I can, I can, I can have no propagators to the right of T1, but I can have points connected with propagators between 0 and T second or between T second and T1. What I cannot have is a 
is a propagator connecting the point in this the first segment with the propagator with the point in the second segment because that could be non planar right so that's where planarity comes becomes crucial as well <coughs> sorry but then if you consider all possible propagators you can write combining points within this segment is nothing but again this blue blob that defines uh, our W function, yes? So essentially, this is the, the W of t, the first term is just the one, and the second term is an integral because then I have to move the position of t prime and t second for all possible values, this order integrals between zero and t. And I'm gonna have this effective propagator between t and t prime, but then I'm gonna have a, a W of t second for all propagators in this segment, and a W of t minus t second for all the propagators in this other segment. So if you are able, so g is known once you, you are told what is your, your curve, you know what the effective propagator is, and W is your unknown. If you are able to, uh, to, to solve this integral equation, you, you, you compute the expectation value of this Wilson loop by taking specific values of t if you want. So what you can do is to do iterat iterative approximations. For instance, to live in order, you can say that W is one, then you go and you put one here and get like a first correction, and then you can go on and go on. In, this, in the same fashion, you, you always solve an integral equation. Uh, if you somehow manage to solve this exactly, you are what you are getting is the full, the complete sum of all possible di ladder diagrams to this expectation value, right? Still, this is a complicated problem, but there is a, a special case in which it becomes very simple. And this is a circular loop. If you take the circular loop, remember this G function was a complicated function of the of the parameterization. But if you take the curve, the, circ the circle, it turns out the, the numerator and the denominator becomes the same, essentially, and you get a constant effective propagator. And this is crucial. Because now, if this is just a constant, this is just a convolution, right? If this is just a convolution, this is very simple to solve by doing a Laplace transform. If you do a Laplace transform, this integral equation, when you have a convolution, becomes a quadratic equation for the Laplace transform of your W of t function. <coughs> you solve this quadratic equation, you have this function of conjugate Laplace variable set, but then if you transform back to t, anti-transform back to t, you get some Bessel function. As I said, for the case of the circle, this is going to be the, the, the expectation value of the Wilson loop when you evaluate it in t0 and t, or t1, 0 and t2 equal to 2 pi in order for this to be a closed contour. So if you evaluate now W of 2 pi, you get the, the famous Bessel 1 function that gives so far, the sum of all ladder diagrams to the circular Wilson loop. This is was done almost 20 years ago in this paper by Eric Semenov and Sarembo. And they argue that this was the full story, that the interaction diagrams should not be taken into account. Okay, the pressing question that you already were asking so far is, how do we sum diagrams with, with vertices, right? And the simple answer to this question is that we don't do it at all. Um, but there is a reason for, doing, for not doing this, for not doing the sum. If for the circular case, Eric and Semenov and Salembo already discovered that when they, they, they did the explicit two loop computations, these two guys, for the case of the circular loop, they cancel exactly. It's not that you are dismissing that, but for the circular case, this is equal to minus this. And they, this is just the end of the story of to loop. So what, well, they conjecture, okay, maybe it is that to all loop order, this cancellation fades off. Okay, but this is still not, not satisfactory because it's just a conjecture. But then you can see that there is another way of doing this computation for computing the expectation value of a circle of the circular Wilson loop, which is uh, using supersymmetric localization. Then you do not assume anything, and then you find that this Bessel function was the, the exact answer. So this is somehow um, 
confirming that the cancellation is a, a, an unlit effect. So let me, I'm not gonna talk about supersymmetric localization, let me just mention the idea. So the cru it is crucial to have an action which is invariant under some supersymmetry and also to have that the path integral measure of your theory is also invariant under this supersymmetry. Then what you, the idea is just to deform the partition function of your theory with the, the supersymmetry variation of something that should be clever, cleverly chosen for this to work or to be useful. Um, but then once you do this, you can see that if you take the derivative, I mean how it depends this partition function with this parameter you are introducing with this deformation. So this deform partition function can in principle depend on t. But then because of the invariance of the action and the partition function, you realize that the derivative of the partition function, the deformed partition function with respect to t is just uh, the, the path integral of the total variation and it's zero. So, so it turns out that if you compute it with uh, any value of t, you are always getting the same answer, the, 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 the answer with t equal to zero, which was your original theory. So, and the idea is that, okay, if you can do it for any t, let's do it for t going to infinity, where you have a semi-classical saddle point approximation, but because of this property, this is exact. And it turns out that many, uh, when you go to this limit, uh, uh, well, the semi-classical computation is, is a lot simpler. It's just the partition function get localized on what sometimes is called the critical point of this variation, plus some one loop correction. Um, and in many cases, you get a simple answer. In some other cases, it's not that simple. Um, as you will see, in, it's very simple in the case of unequal forces and mills. Another thing I, I also wanted to say is that here I was talking about supersymmetry, uh, supersymmetry of your theory, but it might be that you have operators in your theory that are invariant under this supersymmetry you use to localize, and those objects can also be computed in the localized theory. But as I said, I mean, in general, this could uh, be useful or not very useful, it depends on how simple do you get your localized action. In the case of unequal super young mills, the simplification of the, your theory is massive. You, you get a substantial localization of all you, the, you, I mean the only thing you can have are constant matrices. So at the end of the day, the partition function of unequal four super young mills is reduced to a partition function of a matrix, which is moreover just Gaussian. So this is very simple, this is very well-known standard problem for many years. Um, and moreover, that was done by testing uh, already more than 10 years ago. He also showed that now when you go to the, the circular Wilson loop that was considered by, or I was considering before, you realize that the supersymmetry you use to localize is also one of the supersymmetries of this circular Wilson loop. So the expectation value of this circular Wilson loop is just an, a mean value in this matrix model. And the expectation value of the Wilson loop is just the, the mean value in the matrix model of the trace of the exponential of this matrix to be the zero. And then, okay, this is also a very standard problem. So you can, you can solve it in general, but it, if you go to the large end limit, this you get a semi semicircle Wigner distribution of eigenvalues and you get this. So the expectation value of, of this exponential is just this integral. And then this integral, you, you, you can go to any tail and you, you, you discover that this is the, the Bessel function I showed you before. But here I was assuming nothing about ladders or interaction diagram. So this is the exact answer. So by, by a different method, but so it means that this, for this circular case, this cancellation of of diagram of interaction diagrams should take place to any loop order, right? But so far, okay, let me briefly say because I'm running out of time otherwise. So now you have a, this is the idea of a precision test. Now you have an exact answer, so you can, okay, this is the expectation value of the Wilson loop doing just field theory computations. I can take it to to any value of lambda I want, in particular when lambda is very large, 
If lambda is very large, you get this expansion. But recall that from the ADS CFT perspective, the expectation value of Wilson loop should be the, the exponential of the minimal area in the so this should be minus the area of the of the worksheet, the, the the minimal area ending on the circular loop. Right? And that, that was the very first check. So now if you consider a circular loop, you can see that a, a, an, a semispherical dome is the minimal configuration when you work in point carry coordinates. So this is the solution. Of, of course, if you try to compute the, the area of this guy, it's infinite because when set goes to zero, this you have an infinite area all along the boundary. But then if you regularize this area, the regularized area is precisely min minus the square root of lambda, and then it's precisely what the supersymmetric localization results predict. Okay, it's, it's a check. It's not very impressive, but it's a check. Now let, let me go move to the connected correlator. So this is what we did in these two, these two articles. So far I was talking about just the expectation value of a singular, a single circular Wilson loop. Now I'm going to compute the connected correlator. The connected correlator is the correct, is the, con the correlator minus the, the product of individual expectation values. And I will consider two circular Wilson loops concentric, right? In general, it could be of different radia, R1 and R2, and separated in some transverse direction by a distance h. So h is a spatial separation. But I, I would also consider some kind of internal space separation. So remember that the Wilson loops <laughs> coupled with a scalar through this unit vector. I will take the unit vector to be in, in, the, in the first loop to be just one, zero, 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 and then in the second one, I, I just gonna uh, put some angle gamma, and gamma is like internal space, some internal space separation. So for the case of gamma equal to zero, the, this problem was uh, already conjectured many years ago by Sarembo. By introducing this gamma, we can we have room to, to play a little bit with this parameter in order it's, it's going to allow it's going to allow to get supersymmetric correlators and also to implement the ladder limit. Yeah. I mean, individually, each loop is supersymmetric, but if you are taking at different positions and with different orientations, in general, the supersymmetries preserved by one loop or the other are different. But, but then it's, it turns out that if you tune a relation between this, the this, the spatial, the spatial, and the internal space separation, you can get, you can make them to to have supersymmetries in common. Okay, but <coughs> before doing that, let, let's see. Let's try to consider the supersym, the the ladder contribution to these correlators. Now, so again, we have to compute this um, effective propagator between these two of two O type of operators. Remember, they contain the gluon and a scalar. But now these operators can be in the first or in the second loop. So you have two types of, of propagators. One of them, the, we will call them rainbows, and they pick them in blue. Is you have a rainbow when the, the two operators are in the same loop. And we already seen, this is the same as before, this is just a constant because this is a circular Wilson loop. Circular Wilson loop. But you can also take a propagator that connect a point in the first loop with a point in the second loop, and we are going to call ladders here. Although in my original definition, both of them are ladders, but let me call ladders for the moment for the, for the rest of the talk, those propagators that connect to different loops. So, but those are not constant. So those are this complicated, if you want, function of cos t minus t prime. Again, okay, now the connected correlator is can be computed with this auxiliary k function, which is like the, the connected correlator of two traces of this abelian phase I have defined before. But then when you try to, to write down an equation for this, you realize that you, this is written in terms of another auxiliary function, which is looks similar. But in this case, there is a single trace uh, in these two abelian phases. So it's a different object. Schematically, you represent them like them, like this. And again, you can play a little bit as before and try to, to derive some integral equation this guy as we said before. And the idea is more or less the same. So the connected um, 
correlator between these two traces is depicted by a yellow blob now. Okay, let me call T prime now the rightmost point. That at least there is going to be a propagator. Otherwise, if there was no propagator in, in, the, in the lower segment, that could be disconnected from the first one. So there is at least one. Let me call T prime the rightmost point connected with the propagator. And there are two possibilities. Either this is connected with another point in the same segment, which I call T, t second, or it is connected with a point in, a, in another segment, in the ladder. If it is connected with a with a s another point in the same segment, we are going to have a rainbow, but it could it could go this way or this other way, and it's topologically different. So that's why I draw in the two things. But at the end of the day, you use identities, and you can show that these two diagrams are actually the same. There is nothing to the left, to the right of t prime. You can have a uh, blue propagators in between t prime and t second, and then the rest. You still want this to be connected, otherwise it will be not, not to be the connected correlator. So it's going to be another yellow blob, but now of uh, and a smaller segment. Uh, so it's a K of T second. And then as, as far as this guy, so this, this connection now connects everything within the single trace. And what you get is this object I, I have defined gamma. So let me just skip the details. But so you get an integral equation for this guy that is going to compute a connected correlator, which is now an integral equation. That now W is the W function we already knew. This is, this is a Bessel function of K. But you see, it is not closed because you have another term that depends on this other auxiliary function gamma, which we still don't know. But now, if you repeat the same logic and you analyze uh, what are the possible contributions for this gamma, you get an integral equation for gamma, in which in this case is closed. So now this depends on the Ws, which are known, and then this integral is just depending on gamma. So this is a closed equation. So you have a procedure, a recipe if you want. The first thing you, you should have to do is to solve the integral equation for gamma, then solve for k once you know gamma, and then evaluate in k equal to pi, and then it's going to give you the ladder contribution to this connected correlator. This is still very difficult in general, but there is a critical case which in which the, the rainbow, sorry, the ladder propagator, I am just collecting all space-time parameters, radius and space-time separation in this cosh gamma. I'm using cosh because it is, it's for real values, it's larger than one. And then you see that the numerator and denominator are pretty much the same, with the difference you have a cos gamma here and a cos beta here. There. If you were able to take cos gamma equal to minus cos, cos beta, this becomes constant. The same constant as, as before, but with a different sign. You see, it, 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 this amounts to take like uh, some analytic continuation of this angle, because this is, as I said, this is larger. This is a, a number which in modulus is larger, and absolute value is larger than one. So you need like to analytically continue this internal space separation. But let this aside for the moment. If you get that your ladder propagator is also constant, you can use, uh, you can again solve the integral equations in Laplace transform very easily, and then you get an exact answer for the ladder. Contribution to the correlator of two Wilson loops. And then you realize that this, precisely this fine tuning is the one that makes the, the correlator supersymmetric. You can compute the same guy using localization with the matrix model, and then you get exactly the same answer, right? So you have this uh, supersymmetric case with this specific relation of parameters. It seems that the non-ladder diagrams cancel out again. In the last minute, let me discuss another situation in which you can, you can use this, this equation, which is the ladder limit. This is a generalization of an idea we employ to, to study the cusp phenomena dimension. Uh, it's a similar limit. A ladder limit is, let me just take, again, this some analytical extension of this internal space separation such that it allows to take any value for the cos of gamma. And in particular, if you take cos of gamma very large, okay, you, this you need this gamma to be imaginary and very large. Then you, you can have a large cos of gamma. And if you take it to infinity, 
while at the same time you take lambda to zero, you can define this lambda hat to be fixed. Right? This is a very tricky limit in which lambda goes to zero, cos gamma goes to infinity, such that lambda hat is fixed. Then you realize, for instance, in the connected correlator, you can have different contribution. You can have two ladders. Whenever you have a ladder, you're gonna get you're gonna get a cos gamma. And since this is two loop, this is a lambda hat square. You can have a ladder and a rainbow, but the rainbow has no cos gamma. So you have a lambda square but a single cos gamma. So this is lambda hat square over cos gamma. Right? And the same if you consider li like a one loop correction to the ladder. So since there is only two points being connected, there is a single cos gamma. So this is goes like cos li lambda hat square over cos gamma. But if you are in this limit in which cos gamma goes to infinity, you see that these two diagrams are suppressed in comparison to this one. So it is not only that you are dismissing interaction diagrams in this limit, but also you are dismissing any rainbow, a any diagram containing rainbow propagators, right? You, you not only, in this limit, now you not cannot only throw away interaction diagrams, but you can also throw away diagrams with rainbow. And if you remember, rainbows were counted by this W function, so throwing away uh, diagrams with rainbow propagator is the same as setting this W function to one. So now you go to original equations, and what you have to do to study the contribution of ladders in this particular limit, not only take the limit in this, in this function, but also setting W to one. If you now remember this equation for W, has W outside, but also inside, but now it's a lot simpler because this is just the equation that gamma has to satisfy is one plus uh, this integral. Yeah? And recall, this is the effective propagator which you know what it is. So now you can treat this, you can, you can solve this equation by, for instance, taking partial derivatives with respect to the two arguments, T and S. So the ones goes away, then you get in the left hand side the two derivatives of gamma and the right hand side you just get the, in the argument of the integral, right? And then you realize that since this depends only on the difference, it is convenient to go to this, to do this change of coordinate. X is the difference, Y is the, the sum of these parameters F and T. And then you can make this answer that it depends on some function of X times some exponential of omega because th there is no exponential of omega I because Y, because there is no Y dependence here. In the and then, the when, when you do this change of coordinates and this ansatz, this becomes just an ordinary differential equation of second order, which is nothing but a type of Schrodinger problem, where the, the potential is played by the, the, this effective propagator. Okay, anyway, if you try to solve the Schrodinger problem, it could be a very difficult problem, depending on the shape of your, your potential. But since we what we had in mind was to, to try to extract strong coupling behavior, we would like to study this in in the strong lambda, in the in the in the strong coupling limit, right? In the strong coupling limit, there is a lambda hat here. When lambda hat is, is, is very large, this becomes like a semi classical a classical problem. So you have a very deep potential. So the, the ground state is gonna be just a particle sitting at the at the minimum at the bottom of the of the of the of the well and the and the energy W that plays the, the W squared plays the role of the eigenvalue. It's just the, the 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 depth of the well. So, which is some function you know of this is essentially lambda hat and this uh, parameter. So, with this very simple uh, solution in the in the classical limit, you go to the equations of K, you evaluate them into pi, and you uh, and you get this this prediction for the ladder contribution which is going to be the, the, the because moreover in, in this limit, you not, not only we use to simplify the problem, but we also argue that the ladders should be the dominant contribution. So this is a prediction for what the connected correlator should be in this, in this ladder limit. So yeah, so in the last two minutes, and then I will just summarize. Okay, now in order to compare, you need like a, a minimal area connecting the two, the two circles, circles at the boundary. So for partially this problem was addressed with 
without introducing the, the cusp in this paper by Olsen, Olsen and Sarembo, without separating them by Drucker and Fiore in this other paper, we are just t considering the two guys on at the same time. So this is just the parameterization. So this is separate. I cannot depict everything here. This I am depicting just the separation in, in this variable x. Uh, you have symmetry because they are concentric around the the phi angle. Then the radius is just a function of r. And then I'm not. I mean there is also a dependence of the position. This is the point carré radius of ADS is also going to, have to be a function of r. But recall that since I, I take in the two Wilson loops at different, uh, with different special uh, internal space separation, it means that they in the dual phi sphere they are sitting at, at different points. So there is also, uh, this is a, an angle in the phi sphere that also moves uh, between one loop and the other. So then you have to, to plug these boundary conditions to realize this. And then it's, uh, it turns out that, so you have two physical parameters, which are the, the spatial separation and the internal space separation. You can conveniently reparam I mean use some elliptic parameters related to those. And then you get the regularized area in terms of some elliptic function. So this is the exact area of the, this uh, regular, this the exact regularized area of this, of this problem. So this is the, comp the, the dependence on and H and gamma is complicated and implicit, but we are interested in, in a limit in which uh, <coughs> cos gamma is very large, and then you realize that if you take these elliptic parameters to be between 0 and 1 s and t going to infinity, this cos gamma is just t over 1 minus s. And this is a very large number, and then when you go in this, in this regime, the regularized area is, simple, is simply just the square root of t over s, but now you, instead of t, you you use you write it as cos gamma times this factor, and then you get this dependence of cos gamma and, and s. But also s is related to the spatial parameters in this way. And when you replace s by this, you get this expression, which is exactly what the the, the Dyson equation predicted for this operator. <sighs> well, there is some Woolley phase transition, which is. So, as, as I said, I mean, I was considering this. There is also another worksheet with another topology, which is independent on the on the separation, and this is what it is called a, a grosso uri phase transition, because at some point, the regularized area, when they are very close, the minimal area is this one. But when you start to, separ start to separate them, this area grows, while this area is independent of H. At some point, this becomes the minimal area, and this is the phase transition. The, the it was... It's not clear how, but the similar phase transition should be in this uh, Feynman diagram of summation, and then you, you, you can realize that there is also a phase transition in, this, in the sum of ladders. Here, the matching is not precise because, in general, there is there's not the full story, but it is interesting anyway that this is a qualitative feature that, that there is a phase transition also in the sum of ladders. Okay, in order to, to reproduce the exact form of the phase transition, you would need also to include interaction diagrams. But at least qualitative, uh, qualitatively, there is an agreement of this phase transition. So I think I'm just finishing. So what, le, le, what I told you was that the resummation of ladder diagrams to all loop order can be recast into uh, an integral equation of the type of Dyson. And then, as I said, OK, this, in general, is not going to account fully for the expectation value of, or, or, or the correlators of Wilson loops. But there are situations in which you can extract an exact match in any way. One of those situations is when you can make the, the correlators supersymmetric. In, that case, in those cases, it seems that the, um, the ladders exactly account the, uh, so the cancellation of interaction diagrams is exact. And not only you recover the string theory computation, but also it you recover the localization results. There is another case in which you have a quantitative matching, which, which is in this ladder limit, in which this uh, separation in internal space is taken such that the cos gamma is a very large number. In those cases, ladders is not the full story, but it is the leading order in some parametric expansion. 
And also, and again, in this case, when you go to this limit, you, got, you get a matching with the, the area of some wall sheet in the real field. And then what I was saying, the resummation of ladders exhibit the phase transition, which of course is not precisely the phase transition you see for the wall sheet, but it's at least a qualitative matching. Let me just, con just to, to comment on two things. I maybe I, I didn't emphasize in the talk that what is the importance of having this exact uh, knowledge of the expectation value of a Wilson loop, an exact function of lambda. This is a prediction for all quantum corrections to the your semi-classical uh, string computation, which is by, f by far the very non-obvious problem. So now if you, instead of just finding the minimal area, you expand this Bessel function to beyond the leading order, you get like these uh, corrections. So this is like a, now it's like letting quantum fluctuations to be turned on in this wall sheet, compute one loop determinant, and then you would expect an order one correction, but then you have this nasty log lambda here, which is associated to zero modes. And this is, is in spite of this reasonable to expect them, there are many attempts to extract this coefficient, to argument, but there is no computation that honestly take into account the zero modes computation. So this is a still an open problem. In, in spite of being the, the most obvious thing you would do uh, beyond, I mean, it's still kind of not really fully understand. Something I didn't say, I was working in the planar limit, but it turns out that the matrix model can also be solved in the exact and uh, for a, for for a not only exact in lambda but also exact in n. So the expectation value exactly as a function of lambda and n is this Laguerre function times this exponential. So now you can expand it as an exact function of lambda in powers of one over n. So this is the vessel we saw here, but then you have like a one over n square, and you get some other vessel function. And this is again a very very nice prediction because this is. So you have prediction for all loop, I mean all possible string interactions, corrections to this, to, to this. And this is also still not, not, not verified. So this is a still an open problem. So it's, it's like a, we, we the, the matrix model is like, it's like our theory, and then the string theory is our experimental setup. So you, you would like to experimentally reproduce the prediction of the matrix model. So it's some, uh, experimentally I mean the, the, the explicit string theory computation, but it is uh, still, so those quantum corrections or string corrections are very difficult to do because it's, these are in, in, in curved space, in ADS, but so this, this exact results open the possibility to, to predict any kind of uh, quantum or, or string corrections to, to a string theory computation. So. I think those pointing out that, that there are still open these two problems is uh, something that I, I wanted to emphasize, and this is that's, a, that's the end of, of the talk. Thank you. <laughs>